If God exists, why is there suffering? I might expand the title to say, if God is love, why is there so much suffering? Why do the innocent suffer? For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Well, we're going on to a very uh, difficult and challenging subject tonight, dealing with if God exists, why is there suffering? I might expand the title to say if God is love, why is there so much suffering? Why do the innocent suffer? If God's all-powerful, why doesn't he destroy the devil? There's a lot of whys and a lot of dear people and brilliant people when they ask this question, because they don't understand what the Bible teaches on this, they throw aside God altogether. They say, how could there be a good God in a world where there's so much bad? How many of you have asked this question before? You've thought these things. We're going to again go to our first question for this presentation and I'm going to talk a little bit about why is there sin and suffering? Why is there evil? Why would a good God make a bad devil? Big questions. Number one, with whom did sin or evil originate? According to the Bible, if you look in John chapter 3 verse 8, it says, the devil sinneth from the beginning. Sin in the world and suffering in the world originated with this arch villain that we sometimes call Satan or the devil. He comes by many names. Virtually every religion in the world has a God of good, and then they've got this sinister evil God because everyone can see it acting out in life. You see these beautiful things of creation, butterflies coming out of their cocoons and just wonderful things of great beauty. And then we see things that are vicious, you see, you know, an innocent little fawn being torn apart by a lion, and you say, wow, that just doesn't look right. There's such ferocity and brutality in the world. Was that the original plan? You read in Genesis, when God made everything, it says, it was good, good, and he concludes by saying, very good. Something happened. Stay with me. Again, he's called that old serpent, called the devil and Satan. You go to Revelation, and uh, right there it identifies this, and by the way, in that same verse it calls him the dragon. The dragon, the serpent, Satan, the devil. And so in the Bible you'll hear references to the dragon and to the serpent, and they are typically symbolic of the devil because he sort of got branded with that logo at the beginning in the Garden of Eden, which we'll talk about in a moment here. Number two. What was Satan's name before he sinned, and where was he living at that time? Well, if you read in Isaiah 14, it says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Now, the name Satan means adversary. He wasn't always an adversary. God did not make an evil devil, because that would make God an accomplice for evil and sin. And the Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from God. God doesn't do anything wrong. He's perfect. And there's no evil that proceeds from God. If evil proceeds from God, then why would he punish sinners for being evil? This is so important that we understand this. It'll change your whole world view. Stay with me. What was the origin of Lucifer and what responsible position did he hold? And how much does the Bible describe him? Well, it tells us in Ezekiel 28, speaking about the origin of Lucifer, you were perfect in your ways. So did God make a defective devil? You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. He wasn't born. He was created. You and I are all born, but there are certain beings that are created. Adam was created. God created Eve. Angels are created. They don't have children and procreate. Lucifer was created long, long time ago. And when God made him, he was perfect. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created till iniquity was found in you. It goes on to tell us about his position. You are the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. Now, if you read in the Bible, you've probably heard about the Ark of the Covenant. 
this sacred object that was in the Holy of Holies in the temple. And above the ark, there were two angels. They're called covering cherubs. It's the highest position. It represents the throne of God, that ark on earth. And in heaven, God does not have golden angels on the right and left of his throne. He's got real angels. The golden angels on the ark were symbols of the real angels by the throne of God. Lucifer held one of those positions. Highest position of any created being was position of one of those angels. What led to Lucifer's sin, his rebellion? It says in Ezekiel 28, as we read on in the same passage, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You've corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. You know, you've heard it said before that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Because of his exalted position and incredible powers, the Bible says angels are more powerful than men. You read that in Hebrews. Man was made a little lower than the angels, it tells us in Psalms. He is the chief of the angels, incredibly powerful being. And you and I in our own strength are no match for the devil. But always remember that you and Jesus are a majority. You and Jesus can bring down any giants. You don't need to be afraid of the devil if you're with Christ because Christ defeats the devil every time. But here he was, this powerful angel, worshipped by the other angels, brilliant, good-looking, and because of his gifts, he began to worship himself instead of God. Now, you might be thinking, well, did God make a mistake? Obviously, the wiring was wrong at the factory. If, if this one angel started worshiping himself, didn't, didn't God do something wrong? Couldn't God have made him where he never would think those proud, selfish thoughts? Yeah, God could have made him like that, but can you love if you're a robot? Let me ask you another question. If God makes all of his creatures free to love, if he pre-programs his creatures to love, is that love? God doesn't force any of his creatures to love him. He made Lucifer and all of his creatures with freedom intelligence, a free will. They could choose to process the information with the minds and the intelligence they have and draw their own conclusions. He can only hope that they'll love him, but he doesn't force us to love him. What happened in heaven is a consequence of Lucifer's rebellion. It tells us, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought in his angels. All right, here's something that we know right away is that Lucifer, Satan, is now not alone in his rebellion. You notice there it says the dragon and his what? His angels. That means that when Lucifer first began to nurture these rebellious thoughts because he was so in love with himself and his looks and, and his intelligence, he thought, I should be God. I will be like the Most High. He is the ultimate megalomaniac, narcissistic, and that's acted out in the lives of some who follow him. He began to circulate among the other angels and with his incredible intelligence and his political skill, he began to say, you know, why does God have rules? Why does God have a law? We should have more freedom. We, we, don't, we should have no restrictions. And he began to question the government and the leadership of God on every point, but he would do it subtly by innuendo. You've seen people do that before. They'll try to besmirch your character by planting questions. And the devil's a master at that. And he went among the angels and he began to insinuate among the angels that God is not good, that God is not fair, that if he was God, things would be much better. And he managed somehow, according to the Bible, it says one third of the angels sided with Lucifer in his rebellion. Can you imagine that? And so ultimately it broke out in some cosmic conflict there in heaven between God and his angels and the devil and his angels. And of course it uses a, a symbolic word. It calls him the dragon, but we all know who that is. Until finally they are evicted. I don't know what weapons they use, but there was some kind of titanic colossal combat between these spiritual forces. And that war is still going on today except this planet is now the battleground. How did it all get transferred down here? Uh, we'll get to that now. When God created Adam and Eve, what one thing did he forbid them to do? 
But of the knowledge of the good, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, it says, you shall die. He told them, don't go by that tree. Well, what happened? It tells us in the Bible that um, Eve was evidently wandering around in the garden examining the fruit or doing some harvesting and she saw that tree and maybe it was a beautiful tree, probably was, sin usually is, probably had neon lights or something, I don't know. And as she drew near the tree, all of a sudden the devil had evidently, you know, God can possess people, the devil can possess people. God has spoken through donkeys, the devil can speak through animals too. And the devil took this serpent, which was one of the most hypnotic of all the creatures in the garden. Evidently, it could fly before. And that's where you get all these legends of the winged serpents. And that serpent was up there in the tree. And perhaps he was eating the fruit. As if to say, look, nothing's wrong with me. As a matter of fact, before I ate this fruit, I couldn't even talk. Now look what it's done for me. Hey, beautiful, come here for a minute. I want to talk to you. And so she ate this forbidden fruit and then brought it to her husband, and that's when sin came into the world. Now, I've run ahead of my questions here. What medium did Satan use to deceive Eve, and what lies did he tell her? Now, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Genesis 3, verse 1. And then the serpent said to the woman, you won't really die. Now, notice this. God told Adam and Eve very clearly, if you eat the forbidden fruit, you will die. The devil is completely contradicting the Word of God. By the way, the first question in the Bible is the devil questioning the Word of God. You know why we've got so many problems in the world today? It's because the devil is still getting people to question the Word of God. It all came from doubting God's Word. And then after that, man lost dominion of the planet. Keep in mind, when God first made Adam and Eve, God made man in his own image. In the same way that God is supreme and a ruler and God can create, God made man so he has the ability to procreate and man was to be the ruler of this world. The minion of the planet was given to Adam, the highest of all God's creatures. The crowning act of creation was man and woman. And when Adam and Eve chose to listen to the word of the enemy instead of the word of God, they basically handed the keys of this planet to Satan. We lost control. Even Jesus says the devil is the prince of this world. So you are living in a planet that is a war zone. You can see it around you all the time. And instead of saying, why do so many bad things happen, we ought to be thanking the Lord that so many good things happen. God intervenes a great deal to protect, but there are limits based on his own character and justice on what he can do in this world except as we ask him through prayer to intervene in our lives. There's a cosmic conflict transpiring down here. It goes on to say in Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and goes to destroy the remnant of her seed that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. The dragon, who's the dragon? We're learning what these symbols mean. Was wroth, angry with the woman. Who's the woman? That'd be God's church. And he goes to make war with the remnant, that means the remainder of her seed or her descendants, her children. And so there's this war going on. Now, here's the good news. It's like kind of a political campaign. The devil has cast his vote against you. He wants you to be destroyed. The devil hates you. And you might be wondering, why does the devil hate me so much? It's because he hates God. And he wants to hurt God by hurting you. Because the devil knows that God loves you. I want to ask you, parents, what would hurt you more if someone tortured you or made you watch as they tortured your child? What would hurt more? We have five children, had six, we lost a son. I know what it looks like to see a child in the hospital suffering. And, uh, is, uh, oh, if you could trade places and say, Lord, let it be me. I'd rather suffer than watch them suffer. God made this beautiful world. The devil tries to corrupt it because it all hurts God. And while we're down here shaking our fist at God, saying, if you're so good, why are you allowing all this? And God is saying, this hurts me much more than it hurts you. 
That's why Jesus came to show us what God is like. Jesus came to show us what his Father is like. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And Jesus came to be our substitute, our example and our substitute to take our place. Why was eating a piece of fruit such a deadly offense? And why were Adam and Eve removed from the garden? He that commits sin is of the devil. John 3, verse 8. When a person sins, they are listening to the enemy. And basically, they were casting their vote on the side of the devil. And again, Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Don't you know that who you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are the one slaves who you obey. Whoever you obey, that's whose servant you are. Whether sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. So whose servant do you want to be? By the way, whether you want to or not, whether you believe it or not, you are all somebody's servant. We are all either serving God or the enemy. Well, I started telling you a minute ago, it's like a political campaign. The devil's cast his vote against you. God has cast his vote for you. You have the tie-breaking vote. You do. You have a free choice. Who you want to serve. How powerful and effective are Satan's temptations and strategies? Well, I don't want to give him any glory, but the Bible tells us that we should be aware of our enemy. Matthew 24, 24, there will be false Christs and false prophets that will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if it were possible, even the very elect. It says, the devil who deceiveth the whole world. In the last days, his deceptions are going to be so compelling that the vast majority of the world is going to follow him. That's why I'm glad that you're here and listening. The Bible says, broad is the way that leads to destruction. Most people follow the devil. They don't, and he's not running around with a red leotards and a goatee and horns. I mean, who would follow him? The devil is a smooth operator. He makes sin as attractive as he can. He is a master of marketing his philosophy. There are three principal areas where the devil tempts us. It says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it's of the world. And the world's going to pass away in the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God will abide forever. In the temptation of Jesus, he was tempted those three areas of sin, lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Remember, the devil said to Christ, if you're the Son of God, take these stones and turn them into bread, tempting his physical temptations. And Jesus answered with the Bible. He said, it is written, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him up to the um, pinnacle of the temple. And he said, if you're the son of God, cast yourself down. And then the devil quotes the Bible. For it is written, he'll give his angels charge over thee, and they'll bear you up in your hands lest you dash your foot against the stone. Does the devil know the Bible? So does he misquote it? Should it surprise you that there are a lot of different religions out there that claim to believe the Bible, but they misquote it? And he did it even to Jesus. He still does it today. Third temptation. He took him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said, all these things I'll give you if you'll bow down and worship me. What does the devil want? He wants to be God. He wanted to subjugate Christ. He wants that position. It's very clear what he wants. And Jesus said, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Notice all three times that Jesus fought temptation, he used weapons that are available to you and me. He used the Bible. So what is our best defense? Remember we found out this represents the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. As you hide His Word in your heart, it gives you strength against temptation. That's why it's so important for us to study and read the Bible. It tells us to put on the whole armor of God that we might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. God has provided a way for you to be victorious over every temptation. You know, when I came to the Lord, uh, the first time I was drinking and smoking and using drugs and had all kinds of addictions and problems. And by the grace of God, he saved me from the, the alcohol, the cigarettes, the drugs, the um, immorality, bad language. Oh, I had a bad mouth. 
That to me is one of the biggest miracles of all. He gave me a new vocabulary. You haven't heard me slip once, have you? It's just he reprogrammed me, and he'll do that for you. He makes you a new creature. In our own power, we can't defeat the devil. But through Christ, all things are possible. What is it that forever settles the horrible problem of sin, and will sin ever rise up again? You can read in the book Nahum, chapter 1, verse 9, affliction or sin will not rise up again the second time. You might be thinking, once the devil's gone, how do we know this will never happen again? The whole universe has observed this great conflict between good and evil here on this planet. Nobody is ever going to forget. And forever in the hands of Jesus, when he rose from the dead, he still had the scars. As a reminder of what the terrible punishment of sin is, the terrible consequences of sin, he suffered for that. Nobody's going to want to experiment with selfishness ever again. Who makes the final, complete eradication of sin from the universe a certainty? 1 John 3, verse 8. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Who's the Son of God? Jesus. He came to destroy the works of the devil. And that's why you've got to let him destroy those things in you. He will. He'll make you a new creature. And again, Hebrews 2, verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, Christ, also himself likewise took the part of the same, that through death Jesus might destroy him that has the power of death, that is the devil. You don't have to be afraid of death. Through Christ, because he died and rose again, you can have a new body, you can rise again, you can live forever, because what Jesus did, he destroyed the power of the devil. You know, I want to raise the head because I see I'm out of time. I want to close with a little story here. And one day, a, a mother that lived out in the, uh, the back part of southern Florida with her son, they had a big, big pond, small lake on their property. One day, their son said, Mama, it's a hot day. I want to go jump in the pond. They had a little dock, a little beach there on their, their lake by the pond. And he was, she said, okay, real quick and then come in for lunch. True story. He went running out. He didn't even wait till he got to the shore. He just ripping off his clothes down to his bathing suit, got to the edge of the water, and he jumped in. Mom is watching dutifully from the kitchen window where she can see the pond, where he's swimming there. And evidently, a very large alligator had migrated to that pond. They didn't, it had never been there before. And she saw, that as her son was swimming out towards the middle, this big gator slip into the water on the other side and begin swimming towards her son. She dropped her dishes and ran out the door and she began to scream, alligator, alligator, swim for the shore, there's an alligator. Well, he knew what that meant. And he turned around, he's looking all around and he began to swim with all his might and the gator was closing on him pretty quick. She's running down towards the shore. Just as he got up towards the shore, the gator chomped down on his legs the same time the mother lunged, she grabbed his wrists. And then there was a tug of war. And at first the gator's pulling mom off in the water, but you know, mothers are pretty tenacious. And she's pulling back, and her son is slippery, and slipped out of her hand, she grabbed him again, and he's yelling, don't let go, don't let go, and the gator's trying to pull him back and do this roll. She pulled him back up on shore. Well, all this screaming and commotion, the mother and the son, a farmer driving by right near the house heard that. He paused. He looked. He had a rifle in his truck. Grabbed the rifle, ran down there, shot the alligator. Well, the boy was badly scarred uh, on his legs, and he was taken to the hospital. And at first they thought he was going to lose his legs, but the doctors did a remarkable job, and they patched him up so that he kept his legs. After he recovered a little bit, a reporter came to the hospital and asked if he could interview the boy and find out what his ordeal was like and, and get the story. And he said, do you mind if I see your legs? He said, no. And he pulled back the sheets and he showed him the legs and the, the bandages were off and he could see the stitches and the scars. And, and the boy then held up his arms and he said, you know, and I got scars on my arms too because mom wouldn't let go of me. And he was so proud of the scars on his arms. Well, you know, somebody's got scars in their hands because he didn't want to let go of you. And that's Jesus. But you've got to make a decision to hang on to him. He says, I'll not let go of you, but you've got to come to me. He will not force himself on you. He will not force his love on you. He pleads with you to come just as you are. 
and he says he'll give you a new life, he'll give you a victory, he'll give you a purpose. He says it's an abundant life. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with this week's special offer. I think so. You didn't do very well on your report card this last quarter, so... No. You haven't been pulling your weight around here lately. You want help? Well, I wanted help with the dishes last night. Help yourself. Huh? Honey, did you bring the marshmallows? Together, we have spread the gospel much farther than ever before. Thank you for your support. Hello friends, this is Pastor Doug Batchelor, and I wanna thank you for watching Amazing Facts Presents Australia. You know, if you'd like to better understand what's going on in the world and how the final events are gonna play out we've prepared a very special, beautifully illustrated magazine on the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, and we're willing to send it to you absolutely free. All you have to do is ask. To get your free copy, text your name, address, and requested free offer details to 0458-222-444, or visit amazingfacts.com.au. And you can email us at freegifts at amazingfacts.com Dot au. Thank you so much for watching Amazing Facts Presents today. And remember, God's message is our mission. This is your last chance to take advantage of this week's special free offer. There is no cost or obligation. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and be sure to note the offer number when you make your request. This presentation was brought to you by the Friends of the Amazing Facts Ministry.